Good day, everyone. Uh, I think I jumped the gun there a little bit before, but uh, now it's my <laughs> it's my turn to start. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope you've uh, had the benefit of a number of the other sessions uh, yesterday uh, and today. I'm Andrew Auerbach. Uh, I, I work in the global relations uh, and um, and development uh, division uh, here at the uh, at the Center for Tax Policy, working on the implementation of the uh, the uh, the OECD standards. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about, um, of course, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 and, and what we have in mind for supporting, um, supporting uh, developing countries in the implementation uh, of, the, uh, of the two pillar solution. Um, let me just start things off. Um, I was planning on taking about 20 minutes uh, and, 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 then, uh, and then getting some experiences from from some other uh, both colleagues here and, 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 uh, and members, uh, delegates that have had some experience with it. I'll try not to go too far, but I know I, I, I kind of like to talk a lot. So I'll try and, uh, and uh, really hit the major points. I, I think first, uh, I see we have a large crowd, I think about 400 uh, people so far. And, uh, and that's uh, over 400 right now. So that's fantastic. Um, and, and just, I think, for background for everybody, some of you may, may know this more than others, but I think it's important to, uh, to give the context of where the, the, the two-pillar solution comes from and, and, and what it fits into. Um, since 2009, there have been really, uh, I, I think, safe to say, seismic changes in the international tax system, um, largely driven by the G20, first uh, in terms of um, ensuring tax cooperation and access to bank information for tax purposes, exchange of information, which really came out of the, uh, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009, led to the establishment of the Global Forum uh, on Transparency, which, which Pascal uh, just mentioned. Uh, we have over 160 members in the, in the Global Forum now. And, and following on that success with, uh, with tax evasion and, and bank secrecy, uh, the G20 and the world um, it turned its attention to tax avoidance and, and the effective taxation of, of uh, multinational enterprises. And I say the G20, but in, in many ways that was driven by a public, uh, you know, a public outcry and a public opinion that, uh, that corporations were not, um, were, were not being taxed as they should and they weren't paying their fair share. And, and that was because the international rules no longer really worked in order to ensure that the right uh, the right tax was paid, and particularly where uh, companies were, were creating the value that they made. So we needed the BEPS project, Base Erosion and Profit Shifting, to bring more coherence, substance, and transparency to the taxation of multinationals. And a priority through all that was that developing countries uh, should benefit, uh, particularly so because developing countries rely uh, heavily on corporate tax, proportionally much more heavily uh, than developed countries. And so this is a key for domestic resource mobilization. And that led to the establishment of the inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting uh, in 2016. And that gave developing countries a voice both in the implementation of the standards, but also uh, in the rulemaking uh, to finalize the, the, the work on tax avoidance, including the tax challenges arising from digitalization and the two pillar uh, solution that uh, that members of the inclusive framework agreed uh, last uh, last October. So to ensure uh, throughout all that that uh, that the developing countries uh, were able to benefit, having a capacity building program was uh, was crucial. And and so we've been working extensively with developing countries over the past five or six years through a range of different activities, uh, including both as members of the inclusive framework. Um, assisting with BEPS implementation, uh, that the minimum standards entail peer review. Um, and, and so a lot of the, the, the work that we do is supporting countries to uh, navigate the peer review process to ensure that they have successful reviews and if they have recommendations that they are uh, able to, uh, to answer them, uh, those recommendations uh, appropriately and, and, and effectively. Uh, a, a large program of bilateral support uh, where we help uh, uh, help countries uh, deal with the international standards focused on transfer pricing. That's a key issue for uh, many, many developing countries. 
uh, but but wider than that. But um, that's that's targeted support where we're working directly one on one with countries. We have also the global relations program on tax, which has really been the way that the OECD has uh, has um, uh, communicated and and engaged with non OECD members since uh, the early 1990s, and that's based on a, a training program, multilateral and bilateral seminars, and, and, and knowledge resources. Uh, finally, I'll mention Tax Inspectors Without Borders, which is a bespoke program, um, which, which, for those of you who don't know, is, is really, I think, a tremendous, uh, has been a tremendous success. And, and it's, it's a program where we can help developing country tax administrations on tax cases. So uh, pairing uh, experienced tax auditors with uh, host tax administrations and working on actual cases. And, and so it's not about training people to do audits, it's about helping them do audits themselves. And so there's both a, a huge benefit in terms of the success of those audits and, and the TIWB program has helped developing country tax administrations raise more than $1.6 billion uh, since its inception, which is truly phenomenal. Uh, but also there's a knowledge transfer there that's, uh, that's invaluable. Uh, again, mostly based on transfer pricing work, but, but we're, we're, we're broadening that out into other areas. So that's sort of, that's the, the, the general scope of what we do now. Um, and, and last year, five years on from the establishment of the inclusive framework, as I mentioned, the, the, the ability of developing countries to benefit from the international uh, tax framework and, and, and the progress being made. Uh, in the policy areas has been a priority of the G20 and, and the Italian G20 presidency requested uh, that, uh, that we produce a report uh, last year, taking stock of the progress by uh, developing countries uh, in their participation in the inclusive framework in, in implementing the standards um, and, and, and seeing where the challenges were, uh, what was working well, what, what needed to be, uh, to be addressed. And, and so, that report, which came out uh, last October and is, uh, is available uh, on our website, um, provides uh, both a good kind of look back at the history, but also recommendations for further work uh, around the governance, around uh, how developing countries can benefit from BEPS um, and, and in other areas. One of the main recommendations, of course, is also support for the two pillar solution, because this is, again, another key piece of domestic resource mobilization for developing countries and capacity building will be uh, a key uh, part of that. So just, um, again, many of you may know this, but, but for, the, for the context, what is the two pillar solution um, and, 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 and where does it fit here? It was agreed by 137 uh, of the Inclusive Framework members on 8 October last year. Uh, it's a high level political agreement uh, to address the tax challenges arising from digitalization. And, and as such, it's a direct extension of and completion of the BEPS work that was mandated from the G20 in, in 2013, where we delivered the BEPS package in 2015. Action one was about the digital economy. And, and this work is, uh, is the, the, the culmination of that, that process. It, the, the agreement, is the two pillar solution um, proposes fundamental changes to international tax. Pillar one allows market jurisdictions to tax the largest and most profitable companies on the profits they earn from those markets, regardless of whether there's a physical presence. And that's uh, to, to overcome the existing tax treaty rules that, that would allow those companies to, uh, to not pay tax in those jurisdictions. Pillar two sets multilaterally agreed limits on tax competition. So this global minimum tax rate um, of 15% means regardless of what, uh, whether there's uh, you know, tax holidays, whether there's uh, tax avoidance, whether you're shifting profits, uh, you know, wherever you might uh, be getting them, creating you know, magical tax credits, all the fun things that tax lawyers uh, like to do, there's at the end of the day going to be 15% minimum tax. This comes with a detailed implementation plan. The idea is to have this all in effect in 2023. And um, a, a very important point is that developing countries through the inclusive framework 
uh, were very active in the negotiations. Um, and they have a lot to gain uh, if they can implement the rules, uh, the rules effectively. So just a, a little bit of uh, more detail on, on what the two pillars do and, and, and how they benefit, uh, benefit countries. Under pillar one, uh, currently m and don't pay tax in many of the markets. And amount A of pillar one will allow countries to tax uh, those, uh, those M&Es uh, based on the revenue they generate from that country. And, and what we estimate is that over uh, $125 billion of profits will be reallocated uh, to those market jurisdictions. So that's, a, that's a, just a, a, a really monumental change to international tax policy. Um, all, as well, uh, amount B of pillar one deals with transfer pricing. And, and this is an area where many countries struggle, developing countries and developed. Um, particularly though for low capacity countries, uh, the, dealing with transfer pricing disputes and making sure that transfer pricing is, is accurately uh, done and, 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 and they're able to protect their tax base effectively is, is very difficult. What amount B tries to do is um, identify those transactions where we can bring a more formulaic approach to, uh, to transfer pricing to the arm's length principle, taking into account the needs of low capacity countries. Um, I think a distinction that you might you don't want to keep in mind is that amount A of pillar one really are new rules. It's a new taxing right that doesn't exist under the current rules. Amount B is trying to make the existing rules work more efficiently and, and more easily, particularly for low capacity countries. Um, on pillar two, uh, two pieces again, global rules, which is the minimum tax of 15%. Uh, we believe it will generate around 150 uh, billion US dollars in additional tax revenue. So pillar one, that's about taxes, be, ta profits being reallocated, but the 150 billion is additional tax revenue. And, and so that's, uh, that's significant. Um, as well, there's the subject to tax rule, which is um, very uh, important for developing countries where they have given up their right to tax certain payments like interest, or royalties, so they've agreed to a low um, withholding rate in their treaties, on the idea that those payments are subject to tax in the in the in the pay uh, payee country, where in fact um, the uh, the tax system of that payee country doesn't tax uh, that income, the subject to tax rule will allow the developing country to retain taxing rights even above what they've agreed in their treaty. So that's a, a very important. Uh, point for uh, for developing countries, particularly. I mentioned the idea is that this is all going to happen uh, by 2023. So it's a very uh, it's a very ambitious timeline. Uh, these are the target deadlines. Uh, I think importantly, um, there's the idea of having a high level signing ceremony for a multilateral convention. This would give effect to Pillar One, or sorry, Amount A of Pillar One. Uh, the idea is to have that in mid-22. At the same uh, time, a multilateral instrument to implement the STTR. The global rules have already been agreed, but we still need an implementation framework to go along with that and commentary on the rules. That's all being, uh, being, uh, being developed uh, right now. Um, so again, ideas implementation in 23. So things are moving very fast and uh, what we need to do is, uh, is identify how that is going to affect our capacity uh, building. Just looking at my watch and I'm behind. Um, the detailed implementation plan, uh, I think importantly talks about bespoke technical assistance uh, being available to developing countries. And, and I think the word here bespoke is, is important because um, each country will have to evaluate individually how and to the ex and to what extent uh, these rules need to be uh, need to be incorporated into their system and they also need to balance these things with their existing uh, priorities and and so bespoke in this case whereas you know for those of you who were uh, uh, you know working through the, the the minimum standards we had you know specific standards specific peer review process everybody had to do a certain number of things in a certain way 
Um, so there was a little bit more of a factory approach, but here we really need to, to uh, understand uh, each country's circumstances and understand what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of approach is going to be needed for them. Uh, the inclusive framework uh, in the OECD will support uh, the developing country members on, on, on bilateral uh, issues, but, but all members of the inclusive framework or all uh, non-OECD members can benefit from uh, the global relations program, as I mentioned, providing uh, multilateral training. And, and I think the important thing here is this is not uh, a program that will displace what is happening. It needs to work together with it. Um, it needs to take uh, uh, it needs to, uh, to, to be integrated into the existing, uh, existing um, program. So we need a, a comprehensive approach and, and it needs to happen over, uh, over the, the phase, not just this year and next year, but really for, for, the, for the foreseeable future because we have, um, you know, this year we're finalizing the rules, countries need support on that. Um, then, you know, once the rules are in place, Countries will need to legislate them. There needs help on that. And, and, and once they're legislated and in place and operating, uh, countries will need help in, in implementing them in practice, in, in actual cases. Um, what's worked in the past, we, we, we have confidence uh, will work uh, well in the future. Um, and, and that is, again, going back to the, the G20 report, which assesses the, um, uh, the experience of developing countries, I think, you know, the, 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 the conclusion there is that the, the programs that we've had and the modalities of support have worked well. Um, so, but it has to be arranged here. One, regular briefing and updates to keep members informed of developments. I think this is absolutely crucial, especially now things are happening very fast. And so um, keeping track of what's going on and where they need to come into the discussions and how they need to, to input and, 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 and when there are, are key to, decision points, uh, I think, is, uh, is invaluable. We had a, uh, a series of consultations uh, just at the end of January. I'll get into that in a minute in terms of those results. Training is going to be very important, not just general training, but specialized in-depth seminars. Many of these rules are, are very complex, and, um, and, and people, I think, will need the experience of working through a number of fact patterns uh, around uh, you know, how they operate and, and how they need to protect their own interests in respect to the application of them. Uh, bilateral assistance, particularly to support domestic legislation, e-learning so people can go at their own paces. And as I mentioned, TIWB, uh, as, as we move into the practical implementation, uh, I think that that uh, will play a, a, a key role. I, I just wanna uh, stress um, that all of the, 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 the um, the capacity building we do is, is thanks both to donor support, um, both in terms of, of you know, cold hard cash, but also expertise uh, that help to staff our, our, our training programs or, or TIWB initiatives or, or bilateral assistance or what have you. Uh, and, and we work very closely with the uh, PCT partners, the platform for collaboration on tax. So, so the World Bank, the IMF and, and, and the UN. Uh, DP and, and, and regional tax organizations such as ATAF, for example, uh, and other development partners. So uh, this is a, uh, a comprehensive uh, program, not just in terms of its scope, but in terms of uh, the actors and, and, and the, uh, the assistance that we can bring together uh, from, uh, from around the world. Um, I mentioned we had these, uh, we had these uh, consultations, regional consultations, again, talking about regional collaboration. Um, we, uh, we had a, a, a series of, um, uh, of seminars with, uh, with, uh, in Asia, in, uh, in central, A in central Asia, in, uh, in Latin America, Caribbean, in, um, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And, um, these were very valuable to get, you know, both give people an idea of what's going on, but also to hear from them what they're thinking. And I, I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of an idea of, of some of their priorities. On, on pillar one, we asked people, you know, what their highest priorities for the jurisdiction were. And I just want to maybe preface, I mean, the, 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 these are not official country positions. Uh, they're, they're the people who were participating in, uh, in these events, uh, who may or may not have been uh, inclusive framework members. 
uh, different uh, come from different uh, parts of, of government organization, what have you. Uh, but nevertheless, it gives us an indication. And so in pillar one, you can see at the bottom there, um, questions about the tax base and the scope uh, were very high on people's minds. And that means, you know, how do you figure out who's in pillar one, the profits of which companies are going to get allocated, and how you uh, determine how much profit they have to be uh, reallocated. So those are, those are key questions for them. You can see these other issues. Uh, there are uh, a number of them. Uh, and these all form really building blocks uh, of, of both amount A and also then amount, uh, amount B. Um, so uh, that gives us a very, I think, good indication of where the, where the priorities are. On pillar two, uh, we had a question about how much do you think uh, your, your policymakers are, are uh, um, focusing on these things? And, and there, uh, I think at, at the extremes, we had a small number, 10%, 9%, 10% very active steps or, or, or at the other end, really unaware of what's going on. So in the middle there, people at various stages of assessing where, where they are in relation to pillar two and, and what, they, uh, what they will need to do. Um, where people need technical assistance, um, uh, you can see from the pie chart there, three big, I mean, implementation and administration, uh, what are the impacts of the rules and understanding globe STTR. So some basic things. I think the, the, the focus on administration is, is important. Uh, we have a political agreement about, you know, some high principles. We're now developing rules, but how they work in practice is, is I think, uh, the nitty gritty of it all. Um, and, and here, uh, what will be the biggest uh, technical assistance need? Uh, here, legislative changes uh, pace the day. And, and, and there, I think that's consistent with our experience over the past years. Uh, that that's uh, that's something where, where countries really uh, really benefit from our uh, from our assistance or from from capacity building, uh, and just the last one, what is the 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 most efficient capacity building activity? You can see by a long shot, uh, training in depth training and more in depth training. So we we take that very much to heart and and are developing right now a schedule uh, of events that we can we can try and roll out uh, as uh, as we go. Um, I don't want to take too much more time. I want to pass to my colleague Diego, but I, there are a couple of things that we have pillar one, we have pillar two, and, and those are things in, in themselves, but there are a couple of things that go along with them that uh, we also need to provide support on and, and really form a, a fuller package. One is the economic impact. What do these rules mean uh, for countries adopting them? Uh, what, will, uh, what, what, what will they mean? Uh, and, and this is something that policymakers uh, need in order to in order to take decisions and and, and figure out where they stand. Uh, of course, this is something we did throughout uh, throughout the discussions. Uh, VAT on e-commerce should be a priority, and 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 what the impact of Pillar Two is on tax incentives, and I think that's something that uh, we're going to have to help countries with quite a lot. Um, just on the economic impact, of course, we did this work uh, earlier. Uh, but we need to update it because now we have the final terms of the agreement. We also have more data so we can recalculate the residual profit. We can understand what 15% as a minimum rate does. Uh, and, and also we have substance carve outs in, the, uh, in, in, in pillar two, for example, that, uh, that will have an impact. So we're redoing that and, and countries will have access to that work uh, soon. Um, on VAT on e-commerce, this is uh, very important because it, it really goes hand in hand uh, with pillar one. Uh, our, our, our rules, the standard on VAT for e-commerce comes out of uh, the action one report back from 2015. We had a clear standard on that. Uh, many, many countries have, have legislated. Um, it's vital for taxing the, the digital economy. Countries have raised a lot of money. Um, we have a lot of, uh, of, uh, of products, toolkits, uh, resources for countries to use, and, and high demand. So, so we, 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 we want to do work there. And it's not something where you get Pillar 1 or VAT. You, you, you can have them both. So uh, countries should certainly, if they don't have rules on VAT for e-commerce, need to, need to look at that. And if they do, uh, how to make them uh, efficient. And I mentioned the tax incentives. Uh, where you have a 15% minimum tax, no matter what, um, do the incentives still still make sense? Of course, there's substance carve-outs, but if there's an effective tax rate below 15% there, 
at the end of the day, that profit will be taxed at 15%, if not in your country, somewhere else. And so, you know, can you revisit that? And there's a real opportunity for developing countries to, to look at these again and to, uh, and to, to, to find uh, additional revenue without impacting their, their co competitiveness uh, for, for foreign direct investment. Um, a host of, of knowledge resources uh, are going to be uh, important. Um, people need to go at their own pace. They need to support the work that we do. And, and so we are, we are looking at, uh, at these various, uh, various uh, options, including webinars and maybe blended, uh, you know, blended uh, web recorded webinar, then with a live kind of help desk uh, Q&A uh, feature, which can really be both, you, you know, something they can study, but then something that people can, um, uh, can have an interactive session with experts on specific topics. Uh, I'm just going to say two words on, 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 on induction programs. This is something that we did in, in, in the case of the base erosion work, base erosion and profit shifting uh, in, 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 uh, uh, and the implementation of the minimum standards. And, and it worked very well. We have 43 induction programs. Uh, that we've rolled out. And, and it, it's a combination of, of high level engagement with, with policymakers, but then also technical seminars uh, and really developing an action plan about what countries need to do and, and, and then following through that with, uh, with, with the support that they need. And, and we think that, well, that, you know, a similar approach uh, to, to pillar one and two implementation will be important. And also, as I mentioned, the bespoke aspect of this um, where countries really need to evaluate individually what is the impact of, of Pillar 2 on their tax incentives. Um, in terms of Pillar 1, they need to bring in, uh, you know, there's a treaty that will give effect to, to amount A of Pillar 1, but you need domestic rules. Well, how, how do they fit with your, it, your, your existing rules? Uh, do you need them all? Uh, you know, different countries will be different. Uh, the global rules, uh, some countries may bring them in, all of them, some just pieces of them. So, um, so with pillar one, pillar two implementation, we think that that, um, that approach will work well, working directly with countries. Uh, and so we're working on a couple of uh, kind of pilot uh, tests now. Of course, the rules are not finalized yet. The global rules are ready, but we still need a, a, some other aspects there in terms of the implementation. Um, but the rest of the rules are still in flux. So we, 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 we need to obviously stabilize that, but this will be, a, I think, a really, key aspect. And so I think with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Diego, who I hope many of you know. Um, and and uh, I'd like uh, maybe Diego to give us a, a few moments on uh, his experience with, with the induction programs uh, throughout the first uh, sort of BEPS 1.0 and, and, and how they can be a good basis for, um, uh, for going forward. So Diego, over to you. Andrew, thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody. Yeah, really good to see that we've got a bit more than 400 uh, participants at the end of this session. So listen, Andrew, you're right. I mean, induction programs uh, have, have been crucial to our capacity building efforts. And as you can see, what Andrew has been presenting throughout, throughout these last minutes shows how important capacity building is uh, for purposes of the mandate of the inclusive framework. You know, capacity building remains uh, fundamental for us. One of the key components that we think we have been applying appropriately are precisely these induction programs. <clears throat> and these induction programs were launched for new inclusive framework members yeah, at the moment when we when we published the, uh, the the BEPS project, you know, and they were they were they were focused on uh, assisting us uh, getting closer to developing countries to help them better understand the BEPS standards, the BEPS package as a whole, and make some choices in terms of uh, some of the priorities that they needed to, to address. Uh, induction programs have been generally uh, demand-driven. So this means that we, 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 we react to a particular request of a jurisdiction. And the way that they used to work, you know, Andrew mentioned it in a, in a very, very uh, high level. But basically, what we had were, were two stages. A first stage meant that we met. We had, we had physical face-to-face -face meetings, as Pascal was mentioning at the beginning of this uh, session with uh, key decision makers within the governments for tax purposes. And this meant meeting with commission generals, with ministers of finance, eventually with some uh, parliamentarians, you know, key decision makers. And the idea was for us to explain to them, you know, the implications and, and get some political buy-in 
for, for, for countries to be able to, to do all the legislative changes. But further than that, for it helped us uh, transmit to them the advantages of implementing these legislative changes, you know, the benefits for the country of doing so. Uh, this helped uh, these uh, leaders uh, stay up to date on the international developments of, of taxation where we're taking place, you know, in all the, uh, the, the technical meetings. And of course, it allowed them to, to be aware of the need to monitor progress on the implementation of these, of these um, measures or standards by their jurisdiction. So we started with these in the initial high level meetings. We then went and delivered a technical workshops. And these technical workshops were basically uh, oriented or delivered to uh, Ministry of Finance and Tax Administration officials, you know, people who will be in charge of doing the technical work, you know, policy people, of course. And basically, we walked them through the whole uh, four minimum standards. We explained to them the way they would be applied, the way they should be enforced, and, and everything that needed to be done in terms of, uh, of implementing them for the benefit of the country, and of course, and for for, for, for purposes of complying with the commitment that the country had uh, had uh, had agreed with. And then derived from the, the, these meetings and these interactions, we were able to draft an action plan. So the OECD Secretariat prepared an action plan for the developing countries. And these action plans were really useful because they also gave us like specific steps that needed to be taken or followed to be able to reach you know, the final goal of effectively implementing a, uh, a minimum standard. Now, um, we, we were able to see uh, within the, the delivery of these uh, induction programs that interest or, or priorities of countries were maybe not limited to the four minimum standards. So the induction programs allowed us also to discuss about other important uh, BEPS actions that countries wanted to, to consider. And just as an anecdote, for example, there are, there are two of them, you know, the one on transfer pricing, actions eight to 10, and the one on interest deductibility, action four. So these were important and these became priority for certain countries. So we also provide assistance in, in their better understanding and of course in, their, in, in the whole process of implementation. Our induction programs did not finish with our, with our, with our on-site visit, but of course remote assistance continued uh, you know, throughout the process and in the end our ultimate goal was to make sure that we build capacity for developing countries to be able to implement the measures and we were also able to assist them in finalizing the effective implementation. Uh, COVID, of course, hit us really hard, and Pascal was also mentioning that at the beginning. So, so we had to shift from from doing these face to face physical meetings to do do them in a in a remote way. It worked well, but of course, COVID brought with it some other priorities for developing countries. So, so we saw a little bit of a slowdown, which makes a bit of a of sense. But hopefully, you know, with things in 2022 can change, and we can we can look forward and and, and try to focus on on using induction programs for purpose of, of implementing uh, digital. Now, just a final anecdote, Andrew, before I, I hope I'm not taking too long, but maybe some of you attended the, the, the first session today on the G20 report uh, that discussed about, you know, the developing countries and the inclusive framework. And there, Melinda Brown, who hosted that particular session, she was mentioning the importance, and Andrew did as well, the importance of regional meetings, of regional gatherings. So the anecdotal part, for example, is that back in 2019, we delivered a regional induction program for certain several countries for yeah for several countries in the Caribbean and and we called it the regional BEPS induction workshop for the Caribbean jurisdictions and basically we convened you know uh, Caribbean jurisdictions uh, and and we, we did this this induction program and we found that to be really effective and really efficient you know first of all because of the nature and the size of the jurisdictions second because as Melinda was saying earlier today at a regional level, many of the issues become of common interest, you know, so discussions can be much more fluid and, and items being discussed are, 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 are less diverse, you know, than, than doing like a, a global event. So it went pretty well. We had a, a good amount of uh, jurisdictions. We had, of course, a good amount of, uh, of delegates. And the idea, as Andrew was telling at the beginning, is basically try to expand these induction programs to assist countries in their um, in their implementation of pillars one and pillar two. Uh, maybe just to, to, to wrap this up, uh, and again, as I was saying at the beginning, you know, capacity building is key to the mandate of the inclusive framework. And the efforts that we have been uh, undertaking are not limited just to what Andrew was explaining, you know, in, in the previous slides and the induction uh, programs per se. But for example, we, we also support developing countries in the peer review process, you know, in, in the follow up 
of the of the peer review processes with respect to the uh, implementation of the of the BEPS measures of the minimum standards. Uh, we also assist developing countries in participating in the standard setting process, which is of course ongoing and, and will continue for a long time. And we also uh, try to assist developing countries through either bilateral or multilateral capacity support uh, programs. You know, so so the message here is. We, we will continue, there is this mandate and there's this agreement in the statement that Andrew was reading a couple of minutes ago where we spoke capacity building will be delivered for, um, for developing countries. And of course, we very much look forward to assisting countries in um, as much as possible. Uh, Andrew, if it's okay with you, uh, maybe we could open the session for, for, for questions and answers. Uh, and just so you know that I saw one in the chat when you were, when you were almost closing your, your session from Friacre, Dieg Bewison. And uh, the question was basically, what are the allocation keys you know, to the taxable base? And if these keys are favorable for uh, for developing countries, would you like to say a word or two about that, yeah. please? Yeah, certainly, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Diego. Yes, I was just looking at that. Um, and, and also, I think we, we might have uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of participants uh, who can share some experiences, I think from, from, from Egypt and, and Honduras uh, to share their experiences uh, with, with capacity building in the past. But maybe uh, before we go to them, just to answer the question from FIAC, uh, and I, I won't uh, attempt the last name. Uh, thank you, Diego, for doing that. But uh, the question was, uh, yes, what are the uh, allocation keys for the tax base? And do you think these will be favorable to developing countries? Um, merci beaucoup pour la, la question. Thank you um, very much for your question. I think First of all, it's the, the allocation key uh, is uh, amount A of pillar one is intended to give taxing rights to uh, the jurisdiction based on sales and users in the market. So it's not a matter of, it's a matter of being accurate, I think, with respect to that. So uh, what, what the, the challenge is, is to figure out how the revenue and the profit of a multinational where it came from. Sometimes that's easy because it's about sale of a physical product to a person in a, in a, in a place. If it's services, digital services, it, it might get a little bit more murky. Uh, supply chains make things murky. And so uh, they're, they're, the, the challenge and, and what they're trying to do in terms of, in terms of and, and this is the issue about revenue sourcing, is to figure out where the revenue is coming from. So whether it's favorable to, to developing countries, I mean, generally speaking, amount A will be favorable to developing countries because countries will get the right to tax that they didn't have previously. The bigger the market they have, the, the more that will mean to them. Uh, there are rules in, uh, in Pillar 1 that will, um, uh, that will ensure that, uh, A, there's a low nexus threshold, so you don't need huge, huge sales in the jurisdiction to qualify for amount A, uh, but also a, uh, a lower threshold where uh, you're a, a very small, uh, small country. So uh, the rules certainly have been designed also with, with, low, uh, with low income countries in mind. And right now the challenge is to make sure they're as accurate as possible in capturing where the revenue sourcing is. So I think I see uh, Rami's hand from Egypt. So maybe we can turn to uh, Rami right now and, and ask you to share, and thank you for that, ask you to share a little bit of your experience with uh, working with the OECD on the international tax front. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and, uh, and thank you, Diego, uh, for the opportunity to share our experience. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna share our success story uh, for Egypt uh, with the BEPS induction program, which was followed by the launching in 2018 an extended five years uh, country tailored program uh, named Enhanced uh, Domestic Revenue Mobilization through a better tax uh, and exchange of information system. In uh, 2016, Egypt became a member of the inclusive framework on BEPS and worked closely with the ICD on implementing the BEPS minimum standards and priority actions leading to a successful execution for certain policy measures. After two years of the induction program, further support was uh, required and the Egyptian Minister of Finance signed a memorandum of understanding with the ICD for an extended five years uh, country tailored program 
on enhancing domestic uh, resources mobilization. Since then, Egypt uh, witnessed significant legislative reforms in international tax, exchange of information, VAT and e-commerce tax procedures, and the publishing uh, tax guidelines, as well as building a modern international tax unit at the Egyptian tax uh, administration. Uh, from our experience during the past four years, uh, working and working closely with the ICD, uh, we believe the availability of bespoke and induction program and technical assistance to support implementation of the new measures arising from the two pillar solution is critical for the developing countries, but also from experience, there is no one size uh, fit all. Egypt benefits a lot from having a country tailored program uh, through which we received bespoke and technical assistance aligned with the Egyptian legislative framework and resources. Uh, the government of Egypt uh, will also leverage the ongoing work with OECD to complement the OECD Egypt strategy country program signed by the Egyptian uh, prime minister at the OECD headquarters in October uh, 2021, including tax priorities as a key deliverable of the country program. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. I really appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the overview there. I think it really has been a success story with, with Egypt. And I, I very, uh, um, I think just wanna underline your, the, the fact that you stressed uh, the importance of the bespoke nature and, and the kind of tailor-made, because I think that's really uh, what we can offer and, and, and will be absolutely crucial uh, going forward. I'm gonna turn now to Roberto from Honduras. Uh, for a few words, and then if please, if there's any other questions, we're happy to to take them. I think I see a, a, a hand up, but uh, Roberto, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Andrew and, and Diego, and good morning to to and go, or good evening, of course, to to everyone. Uh, so, as as Diego mentioned, in Honduras, we think that uh, capacity building is key uh, as well. And I have to say that in Honduras, we have been a close partner uh, with the OECD Global Relations Program uh, for more than a year, almost more than a year really. Uh, and we have been working together in a capacity building program for our international taxation and, and transfer pricing department. And we have been working on several topics in the, including uh, well, transfer pricing, uh, uh, profit split method, intergroup service agreements, APAs, uh, and whatever. And, and we have also received help on implementing debts in uh, minimum standards. And our work method methodology has been uh, really efficient, I will say, because as uh, both the OECD and our tax administration here in Honduras, uh, we have focal points. Our focal point is, is actually Diego. <laughs> so to execute all these capacity building sessions, uh, the technical workshops, assessments, uh, field visits, and also to answer any questions we have over different topics, uh, we have our focal point that uh, helps us uh, in a personal manner. Is, and, and I hope that like, Diego has done the field visits here in Honduras that he has enjoyed them as well. Um, and right now uh, with the topic on, on, on the pillars, we're, we're looking forward uh, to the evolution of both pillars in the inclusive framework. Uh, and we are also really aware that this is an important topic that requires a lot of political will uh, for this. I'm sure we will, require, we will require a lot of support from the OECD to assess both pillars with the different authorities, not only the tax administration, but also um, the finance ministry, uh, the, well, the, the, the high uh, level government uh, authorities uh, that are involved in this decision. But as well, I know that, that this will be like a wonderful challenge uh, to work on the implementation of that international and national legislation uh, that is needed for that for the both pillars. But, I'm really sure that, that Diego and the rest of the global relations team will have our back. So uh, we're pretty uh, we're pretty sure that we will be in good hands. So thank you, thank you again for the space and, and well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. And that can be our motto. We have your back. I uh, I see, uh, and again, you know, I think it's important to. Uh, and you know, thank you for the the the, the overview and the, and the breadth of the work because it's not simply uh, pillar one, pillar two, but there, there's the existing BEP standards, but but everything else as well. And I think now, as countries uh, you know react to the COVID pandemic and, and and kind of rearranging their fiscal space and 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 dealing with other issues such as 
climate change or informality or, or health uh, uh, policy, uh, there, there is a great scope, uh, I think, to, uh, to work with countries on, on their specific uh, tax policy issues. Uh, I see a question uh, on, uh, in the chat from uh, Canada or from somebody in Canada. Uh, sorry, I don't see the, the name coming up. But uh, building on that question, could you reflect on some of the assumptions underpinning the analysis that led to the 125 billion estimate for amount A reallocation and 150 billion additional tax revenue for pillar two? Uh, how this may split across country income levels and further whether these estimates are reasonable given how you've seen the process evolve. Um, I, I'm not the one who did these these numbers. We we had people in our tax policy and, and statistics unit uh, working very closely with people in our, our economics directorate uh, to uh, to come up with the with the estimates as we move through the negotiation leading up to to October uh, eight political uh, agreement. Now those uh, those estimates were based on the information that we had. Uh, a lot of um, uh, information about uh, about company data and, and what we could uh, what we could understand from their uh, their their makeup. They gave us the 125 billion. So I can't really speak to to the to the details of that uh, or the 150, but I can tell you that uh, following uh, the agreement on October 8th, a number of the assumptions underlying the 125 billion and the 150 billion uh, necessarily changed. So. Uh, there, for example, uh, the, in amount A, um, the uh, you know the terms that we had at the time were a residual profit level of 20 to 30 percent. We didn't know whether it was going to be 20 or whether it was going to be 30. It ended up being 25 percent. So I, I believe those numbers were based on 20 percent. Um, we have, uh, for example, uh, you know carve outs under the globe rules. We have you know, determine the 15% minimum tax. So uh, a number of things changed. And also the data that we had was in particular, I think from 2016. And, and the 2016 data was not necessarily, um, I think probably was pre-BEPS implementation for, for a lot of, 2016 was pretty early. Um, and so uh, as we move on here, we will have 2017 and 2018 data. And uh, and the intention is to uh, is to come up with uh, with estimates across um, across that data as that becomes available. How it splits across country income levels, uh, I don't I don't have that in front of me. I, I know that we have done projections, and I think they're they're available uh, on you know and, and stuff we have we have produced publicly. Uh, and I can say that whatever we've done and released publicly, I uh, I assume we will be updating and and also. Uh, also releasing publicly. So, um, so yeah, are the estimates reasonable given how the process is involved? Well, the, the terms have changed, and so the, the estimates will, will change with them, and they should be even more, I think, uh, including for developing countries, um, and particularly depending on how countries react to, for example, um, you know, Pillar 2 and the Globe Rules. Um, I think that's an area where countries may see uh, that they have a lot of opportunity to pick up uh, revenue there uh, that they're currently foregoing um, in in the quest for FDI and and maybe now that can that can come back into their tax base. But that will depend on country action, and this is where I think the capacity building becomes absolutely crucial, and where again the bespoke nature of this uh, is underscored because we need to work directly with countries to say, okay, you know, what is the situation there? Um, how do these rules impact you? Like how many, you know, how many subsidiaries that are subject to the global rules are, are operating in your country? You know, what what kind what is the effective tax rate on their profits? And and as a result, what what does that mean for you? So every country is going to be different. And that's why this this round of BEPS is different from the last one. And we can build on the experience we had that Diego and and, and both uh, Rami and, and, and Roberto spoke of. But going forward, we need to we need to really um, really do something that's uh, that that goes further, and really uh, really works hand in hand with the with the country's domestic priorities. Sorry, I talk, I spoke a long time. I told you I warned you about that. Are there other questions? I do not see. I don't see any in the chat, Andrew. I, I don't see anything in the chat. 
Well, uh, I will. I will then. I think we're we're about five minutes to to four, so I think uh, then we can we can bring uh, the session to a close. Um, you know, once again, I would just like to I'd like to thank uh, Roberto and and, and Rami for uh, uh, for for intervening. I really appreciate that, um, and and thank you all for for participating, and uh, and also underscore as well that we we rely. On, on our donors and 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 uh, you know and and our development partners uh, for all of this work and and it's it's really I think a, an exciting and challenging uh, future uh, that uh, you know we're all going to have to work very closely together uh, to provide the support that countries need and uh, and we really uh, look forward to that challenge so thank you very very much I just see a, a message in the chat the presentations will be available on our on our event page. Uh, so thank you, and I guess this is the close then for 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 the two days, at least on, on in room one. Uh, I don't know what's going on in room two, um, but again, thank you very much. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, and uh, we will see you uh, next time. You forgot to say muchas gracias. Oh, muchas gracias. Sorry, and I don't know the Portuguese. <laughs> Muito obrigado. Okay, there we go. All right, thank you. Bye.